um, Jonathan comes to us from the Smithsonian Conservation Biological Institute. I'm going to give the postdoc here before us. There seems to be a lot of uh, hype, a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pressure in this, right? Um, I actually want to do two things while, while I have you here, and I'm going to, I'm setting a clock here so that I can make sure I shift gears on time and don't talk too much about this, uh, the first part. But right when I walked in the door at Basin, I walked in and I heard that it's uh, Jonathan Thompson in the Future Scenarios Project, and now it's been mentioned three or four times, so that's good. So it, um, we're beating the communication strategy as far as <laughs> awareness. Uh, and I want to talk to you about where that's headed now uh, if, with an emphasis on uh, a proposal among several LTR sites. But before I get into those slides, I thought I'd back up and say there, there's at least a decade of history about future scenarios in LTER, and uh, when NEON was first starting to be formed, I don't know, back in the 80s or something, it feels like, they talked about the importance of looking at the combination of global, uh, global change drivers, land use, and climate change. And uh, the fact that a couple of human natural systems are so uh, unpredictable, full of feedbacks and nonlinearities and surprises, means that we don't have the same goals for prediction that we do in traditional ecological science or other sciences. And so scenarios are just a way to craft stories about the future, to be able to say what if and maybe bound a range of plausible futures, always knowing that you're going to be wrong. You're never going to get it right. We never would have predicted where we are today in Massachusetts, that shape of the curve. Uh, David always shows a deforestation that the um, our arms. <laughs> uh, okay, we, we never would have predicted that. Uh, so what scenarios do is let people who understand the landscape talk about the future and uh, make predictions, not predictions, makes assumptions that describe ways things might go and that will help people prepare and anticipate and identify areas of vulnerability and adaptability to these combined agents of global change. So. Uh, before 2008, I don't know the scenario story as intimately. I came here in 2008 to, uh, to help work on this. I'm a landscape modeler. But in April 2009, we had a workshop here with 32 representatives from L LTER representing 15 different LTER sites, all of which were involved in some something that they called future scenarios. And it was a wide range. Uh, of what it meant, but it showed the eagerness to, do, to work on future scenarios. About two months later, uh, we went to La Jolla for the Science Council meeting, and LTR said, all right, we, we want some big ideas, and we want some big ideas to the tune of millions of dollars. Eight million dollars was the number they threw out. And so Steve Carver was there, Dave Foster, uh, Kittred Spees, we all got in the room, and. Um, came up with an idea that all the LTER sites could participate in developing few qualitative future scenarios driven by stakeholder stories about where they saw their landscape going, and that that would be integrated into quantitative simulation modeling, that we could look at how these stories would play out in terms of critical ecosystem services, carbon, water. Uh, so it was across the LTER sites. So it included um, agricultural resources and all this. And then, uh, I can't remember who it was who came in with the, with the bad news that, that that $8 million was actually over five years and was spread out for, between three sites. And Steve Carpenter said, oh no, we need $8 million per year to do this for the next five, million, five years. So that was $40 million. And so needless to say, that proposal didn't go very far, but it did get energy and so LTR sort of had this little pot of gold surrounded uh, uh, having to do with future scenarios. And for the past few years, we've been sort of chasing that pot of gold, only to realize that there is no pot of gold for, from LTR to do this cross-site, all-site work. And so that brings me to where I actually have some slides to tell you about something. And that's a, uh, this future scenarios project that everybody keeps talking about. And that... Uh, that's future scenarios of forest change. And we 
we did that so that we could pare down this effort. I, I think there are aspirations out there uh, among the LTR executive board to make uh, future scenarios a um, all site activity, but for now we have six sites who want to, who sort of committed to addressing this question, how global and national scale drivers of environmental and land use change affect the major forested regions of the world over the next 50 years in terms of critical eco ecological indicators and critical ecosystem services. So that's the big question that we're now writing a proposal around, and uh, you saw the list of collaborators that Kathy showed. So I want to talk about that. I talked way more before I even started my slides than I intended to. We saw this uh, slide before. I, I want to emphasize this part real quick because it's important. The, the, the big idea here is that we're going to have two layers of stakeholders defining scenarios. They occur at a national scale. So let's take biomass energy, for example, but it could be conservation, it could be uh, climate mitigation. And we have a national advisory board who talks about how that would occur at a national scale. And we take that to the regions and we say, if biomass energy was the dominant driver on your landscape, if oil prices hit $200 a barrel and wood energy was really important, how would that play out on your landscape? The regional stakeholders will literally draw it on the map for us. The small parcel landowners, they're not going to respond. It's going to be these guys here. And then we're going to take these qualitative uh, scenarios that occur in a region, and that's where I come in. I'm a, I'm a modeler, and we're going to translate those, much, um, much like was done in the Millennium Assessment, but a much region or, regional scale. And we're going to um, look at those in many regions. The same national scale drivers playing out across different regions that have di uh, very different idiosyncrasies of their landscape. So I'm going to talk a little more about this uh, centerpiece of the, uh, of the work, the quantitative modeling. So here's, here's how we look at it. We have these two national scale drivers, climate and socioeconomic drivers, largely land cover change and land use change. And we want to play that out along the physical environment, the given natural disturbance regimes in each one of these landscapes, the land use management scenarios that are defined by the individual scenarios and the biotic drivers. And we want to see how those play out in individual regions. We'll use the stakeholders at the national and regional scales to interpret inter-region dependencies, which is something that, um, it's a difficult part of what we're talking about, but it does tend to get people excited. If biomass markets take off in the lake states, how's that going to affect pulp markets in the southeast? And how's that going to affect dimensional timber if we just use this one example? But we can see how the inter-regions would play out. It's a difficult thing to predict, so we use qualitative scenarios to sort of describe an envelope of that. And then we have various feedbacks uh, from each one of these drivers. We've identified specific uh, watersheds, usually uh, HUC-6 watersheds, and we these are these were selected in part due to their proximity to certain uh, people and LTR, but more importantly, we picked We've picked them to span certain socio-ecological grades. We want, this is the most industrially harvested watershed in the United States. Um, this is Kaweet. This is a, the Harvard Forest and the site of a large landscape conservation effort where a, a scenario uh, about that would play out. Climate change is going to be very, has very different futures in Alaska than it will in Georgia. And so we feel we've use these watersheds to uh, capture the, as many gradients as we can. And an important contribution, so there's been a lot of this sort of regional scenario modeling, and it's been pretty interesting, pretty successful. I think that's the sort of work I do, so I like it. But what's, <laughs> never, uh, what's never been done is a consistent framework across many regions so that you can start to make intersite comparisons. Right now, you know, I did a lot of this work in Oregon, and I've done some of this work in Massachusetts that I'll show in a minute. And uh, while we have some similar drivers, there's too many idiosyncrasies about the models and the assumptions to make strong comparisons between them. So we want to use Landis 2 as a model. It has a, a long history. This is just a map of all the places 
It's been used. It's a nice open source model that's easy to add on to. Uh, it has modules uh, to accept climate change parameters, wildfire, uh, biotic insect, you know, insects, pests, and pests. Uh, we do, for, in Massachusetts, we developed a module to do uh, development and land use change. And uh, Charlie Crystal, I believe, has signed on, maybe, to build a hydrology model so we can look at water quality and quantity from this as well. Uh, Landis deals with above and below ground processes, including carbon and nitrogen cycling. It's spatially interactive, so you can have, uh, you can have contagious properties like fire and, and disease spread across the landscape. Uh, and soon it will have the, the water quality as I talk about. I'm going faster because I, this is still the first half of the talk. <laughs> uh, so we feel from this future scenarios of forest change, we have several major advances. The stakeholder divine envelopes of plausible futures articulated at these two regions. That's something that to our knowledge has never been done before. We have multiple forested regions that span many socio-ecological gradients. We have multiple interacting drivers and processes operating at multiple spatial and temporal scales, so we're able to investigate different scalar relationships and hierarchical relationships. We have these common national level scenarios manifesting distinctly based on things like land tenure and attitudes and uh, knowledge about management, as uh, Dave was talking about. We're going to use a consistent modeling per approach which will permit robust comparisons within and across regions. And we'll, sorry, I think there's two more. We'll identify characteristics of vulnerability and resilience in these landscapes, which will help us. Uh, hopefully shape policy and uh, inform decision making. And finally, these model outputs produce species specific maps that, uh, that are useful for all sorts of different scientists. Uh, in Oregon, we've used these a lot for wildlife habitat suitability indices to look at changing spotted owl habitat and lead habitat. Uh, so there's a lot of value added possibilities to the, to the work. I want to, I don't have, I now have three minutes. I want to talk about how we've started doing this in Massachusetts real quick so you can get a flavor for the sort of questions we can answer. This is a paper that's in uh, review at EcoApps. We've gotten some positive feedback on it, so we feel that's going to uh, be out sooner than later. We, we looked at the influence of land use and climate change. In this case, we were just looking at current trends. We looked at historical data for the past 20 years about timber harvesting and, uh, and development and climate change and set up an experimental design so that we could look at the relative influence of these. Uh, we able to, we, we use the historical data and rather than some dynamic process, we're not trying to predict exactly where it would land you know, a house is going to build, get built on the landscape. Instead, we just define these zones. So these are like the zones that the stakeholders will define for the uh, future scenarios. This is based on uh, historical information. So it's, we use classification and regression trees to define probability zones. So we, we throw out the amount of disturbance on the landscape. In this case, this is the map of uh, development for housing, but we do the same thing for timber. We throw the same amount out on the landscape every year in this spatial distribution using the intensity that we witnessed in the historical data. And these are the results. I'm rolling through this fast. I don't want you to really read this all the lines, but what I want you to take away is all scenarios have large gains in biomass. So each one of these represents one piece of that factorial design. And so we can see that uh, it's really the legacy of the land use history that's driving the future. And while land use and climate change may have an impact, it's actually the, the inertia of this landscape will have a larger relevance, at least on above ground biomass, which is all I have time to talk about today. If this is probably, you know, this is just a 50 year simulation, and 70% increase in biomass is probably too high over 50 years. We don't represent well maybe the amount of small uh, small scale disturbance on the landscape. But in relative terms, I think we do have 70% more biomass to gain. And with these land use scenarios, we can expect a 
about 18% loss due to conversion to non-porous uses compared to only a 4% loss due to timber harvest. That's particularly important given that there's twice as much timber harvest area going on per year as there is development. And we still retain street trees and backyard trees in the development. We don't just turn the development pixel into a parking lot. So we think we're doing a pretty realistic job. And then climate change has a potential to add up to 12%. This is just using uh, temperature and precipitation. There's no CO2 effect in there at all. The, these differences manifest differently across the landscape, which is good because it justifies my use of a landscape simulation model. But you can see even <laughs> in the uh, area, urban area like Boston, we, the Boston Basin, we can expect as much as a 50% gain in biomass, even though we lose, if there were no development occurring, but that drops down to 21, much different out in the Berkshires. So the top numbers here are just the row only and the bottom numbers are the business as usual, the current trend. So that affects the amount of time. So this is just in, honestly, I got this yesterday, but I want to show it real quick because it's the first attempt to use the same modeling framework in two landscapes. So this is a similar sized area around Madison that we used the historical trends, built the classification trees, did everything as we did. We can see in Wisconsin, development and uh, timber harvest are predicted to have about a similar impact. This is climate development and harvest, climate development, climate harvest. So it's that same graph you saw last time. But here, their climate effect is much higher. These four bars are much higher than those four. I would, I'm not getting too excited about that yet because they use totally different um, regionally downscale uh, climate models. And so this is the sort of thing we hope to overcome in the LTR <laughs> project where we'll use the same models everywhere and we'll be able to make these interregional comparisons. But that's the sort of thing we do. Thank you.